Well, good morning. Uh, we're just going to get started, and I know some of us had a, a little adventure getting up here today. Uh, but before I start, I just want to say to everyone else, uh, thank you for being here. You had many opportunities to be elsewhere, but today is really something new for all of our communities. Uh, hello. I am Paul Wu, CEO of the Chinese American Service League, or better known as CASEL. And uh, we're the largest uh, social service agency in the Midwest. Uh, we provide one of the most comprehensive service models for our community and for many underrepresented communities in the Midwest. So I'm really honored to be here today. Change Insight began about two and a half years ago. And it's really thanks to our committed staff and our partner organizations, such as all of you here today, uh, that the launch of this report, our second annual report, is going to be really critical to assure that the AA NHPI community voices are at the table. So without uh, the help of our incredible partner organization, we would not be at this point today. I'd like to personally thank Vanessa, uh, where's Vanessa, my dear friend Vanessa, and Anita, oh, what, co-conspirator right there, and the Coalition of the Asian American Children and Families, who you will hear from next, uh, for really believing in change in sight and being such a strong leaders who connected us with eight other additional New York City and surrounding city organizations. And of course, I want to say thank you to our new partners in New York and across the country who are participants. Your efforts are already making an effort in our communities. So with that, thank you and uh, so much for everyone in attendance today. Uh, we have Change Insight partners. Just want to share that today. I uh, see some of your faces. It's great to see you in person and not via Zoom. Uh, Nonprofit executives, our elected officials, dedicated funders, healthcare providers, and there's so many more that I can't name them all. But this initiative takes an army of leaders for us to achieve our goal. And um, so I also like to thank Deloitte for hosting us today. I know I speak for all uh, Change Insight partners when we say uh, we appreciate Deloitte's hospitality and willingness to provide a platform for this really important cause today. Today is an exciting and significant day in making the release of the second annual Change Insight report, Connected Communities Connect. Change Insight is a first of its kind community-based platform that quantifies and identifies health challenges facing at-risk communities. To do this, a partner nonprofit surveys their communities about factors such as housing, employment, transportation, educational attainment, English proficiency, and so much more. We analyze the data gathered from these surveys to create community-specific risk profiles and gain a greater understanding of the people we serve. We assess to better data, empower, sorry, assess to better data empower us to be better servants and advocates for our communities. And it helps elected leaders, healthcare professionals, and philanthropists, which we have a few in this room, more clearly see where solutions are most needed. Better data is a critical need at risk communities, especially for our community population. Unfortunately, many traditional data sources, such as the US Census, lump all of the nation's 50 plus A and HPI communities into one umbrella Asian American category. This is dangerous practice that renders individual communities needs invisible. It is important to recognize and understand that a given city's Chinese community 
will have far different challenges than another city's Korean community. But it's hard to prove that without community-specific data. Changing site is changing that. We are a network of 19 community-based organizations from coast to coast, representing more than 30 A NHPI ethnic groups, and we are rapidly growing. It's hard to believe that just last year, the network was comprised of only six Chicago-based organizations. The fact that our network tripled and expanded across the country in just one year is a testament to just how necessary this project is. I know our findings will lead to positive change for the communities we serve. We are documenting the needs of most vulnerable members of our communities, empowering them, and our partners with the proof points that they need to access resources. This year, we found some urgent needs facing different communities. 51% of Asian Indian change in site respondents live in poverty. That's a stat. 51% of Chinese respondents have less than a high school education. This is trying to rid of the model minority now. 25% of Korean respondents, that's one in four, are socially isolated. When we, when we talk about mental health, this huge number. Make no mistake, these are devastating findings, and they can be hard to stomach, but they are important to illustrate to our communities, our funders, and our leaders. Once we can quantify the scope of a problem, we can begin to work together to implement solutions and track our impact over time. Change Insight is new, but we are already providing a voice to the voiceless and making an impact. We are showing what AA and HPI and other underrepresented communities can do when we work together. One of Change Insight's new partners this year, of course, is CA. Uh, the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. I'm sorry, I tried to use the acronym out there. Can't be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm honored uh, to introduce the organization co executive director, Vanessa Wong, and uh, Anita Gandana to discuss how and why they choose to get involved with Change Society. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, you know, thank you so much to Paul for reaching out to us and really creating this opportunity to collaborate. We really appreciate all the hard work of the team from Change Insight um, and the Castle folks, and so grateful for this partnership and the commitment to collaboration and to quality data. So my name is Vanessa Leung. I'm co-executive director of the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, CACF. And I'm Anipa Gandana, co-executive director of CACF. CACF is the nation's only Pan-Asian children's advocacy organization, bringing together community-based organizations, youth, parents, and community allies to fight for equity for Asian American Pacific Islander communities across New York. We're a growing coalition of 90 community organizations, many who are represented here today, serving diverse AAPI di diaspora across New York City. Our mission is to advocate for equity and opportunity for marginalized API New Yorkers. We're so grateful for the efforts of the seven community organizational partners and member organizations that participated with Change in Sight this year. Um, and we would love if representatives from those organizations could stand up as we share your names. Um, so Chinese American Planning Council, the Council of People's Organization, COPO, Hamilton Madison House, uh, Grand Street Settlement, um, the New York Chapter of the National Federation of Filipino American Associations, uh, the South Asian Council for Social Services, and United Chinese Association of Brooklyn. Excited about the 
possibilities of change insight. We all know the critical role that data plays in achieving truly equitable systems and services to be able to hold our systems accountable and especially to meet the needs of the most marginalized, those who struggle yet remain otherwise unknown, undercounted, and invisible. So data disaggregation has been central to our coalition. CACS work on data disaggregation began over two decades ago. We launched the Invisible No More campaign almost 15 years ago, and through this campaign, we've won data disaggregation laws in New York City and the state mandating the collection of data on race, ethnicity, and language. only thing, we continue to remain vigilant about implementation of laws um, and continue to advocate to ensure that we get the quality data that we all need. And quality data is vital to our communities. Data drives important policy and government responses to community needs and to community struggles. With our partnership with Change Insight, there is an opportunity for CACF member organizations to collect timely data on the communities that they serve. Data that can challenge harmful myths that Paul was mentioning and stereotypes, the model minority or of the monolith that we're all the same, and that can support program planning and scaling for organizations serving our communities in need. We also see the value of pulling the data together from the participating organizations to see shared struggle and differences between groups across New York City. This will strengthen our collective advocacy effort as we continue our call again this year for key investments from New York City and state for our diverse AAPI communities, the fastest growing group in New York State. So we see our community organization members supporting those struggling with poverty and limited English proficiency. And we know that our members are best positioned to provide the language accessible and culture responsive services that our communities need. So it is Absolutely. I think everybody in this room agrees. Clear, comprehensive data on our diverse AAPI communities is a key tool to creating strong and effective organizations and public policies that lift up the most marginalized New Yorkers. Now it is our distinct honor to introduce our next speaker, who has also been a champion of community and a great partner, the 44th Commissioner of New York City's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the city's doctor, Dr. Ashwin Basson. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. Sorry I was late. Um, traffic is terrible, as usual. Um, also, Rockefeller Center, not easy to get to. <laughs> um, it's great to be here with you. It's great to be here with you on this topic, especially. I want to thank CACF. I want to thank Change in Sight um, for inviting me today to be a part of this discussion. You mentioned my official title, um, but I'm also a husband, I'm a father, uh, I'm still a practicing physician, but I'm also a kid who grew up in the Midwest as a proud member of the AANHPI community, but who felt invisible. Um, I, I actually envy New Yorkers. I, I, I am now a New Yorker, right? I've lived here for almost 15 years, and my kids are all born here, so I'm, I'm a New Yorker, but at least I play. Um, but I grew up in the Midwest and in the 80s. And it was um, a time when so many of us, this rich tapestry you're talking about, the data disaggregation, we could only hope to um, aspire to that someday in the future because most of us felt invisible. Most of us felt overlooked. I remember that feeling as a child. And what was worst about that feeling was the feeling that I had to, my family had to assimilate just to be seen, right? Just to even get our heads above water. We had to behave, act, speak, adopt practices that were of the dominant Western mold. And so look, that comes with trade-offs. That's many decades ago, I'm dating myself and we've made progress. And so I'm really glad to be here today to celebrate that progress and to celebrate this project, which I think is really a, a crucial one. Um, obviously, there's so many ways in which our shared experience um, unifies us, but there is this rich tapestry of culture, of language, of lived experience. And it's only through data, at least as a start through data, that we can start to lift up that richness. Um, it's important that we all see ourselves 
in our data. And so I want to talk a little bit today about what we're trying to do at the city and the public health system to, to make that a reality, but we need you too. And so reports like this are extremely timely. Government can do so much, but we are a blunt instrument, make no mistake, right? We, and I run a health department and a city's public health system that's supposed to care for eight and a half million people, people of overlooked minorities, minoritized groups and dominant decades long ancestral groups in this city. And so it demands partnerships. It demands community partnerships. And sometimes, and COVID taught us this in spades, sometimes we need to partner and get out of the way. And so you all lifting up data like this actually reflects a granularity of engagement, a granularity of partnership and a trust that you're uniquely capable to build that sometimes government can't. We, we aspire to certainly, and we will continue to, to push it, but um, you're in a great position to, to do so. At the health department, we work and have been working to disaggregate data to the greatest extent possible. Um, in, in part because as we disaggregate these data, we, under, we start to understand differences and experience, but that leads us to action. That leads us to resourcing. That leads us to planning, to programs, to policies that actually stop flattening our city and actually reveal the cultural and community topography um, that makes New York City the best city in the world. Um, we also strive to take an intersectional approach if data allows to incorporate as many, as many intersecting identities as possible. Gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, income level, wealth increasingly, not just income, but wealth, inherited wealth, passed on wealth, asset um, base, and of course, place of residence. And correlate, find correlates between that. In a city as densely um, populated as ours, race and place and ethnicity become extremely highly correlated. But they offer us a really strong rubric around which to plan and invest and, and even proportionally over-invest in communities that have been historically disinvested in. Uh, we have heard and we have also responded to um, historical requests to further disaggregate data for the AANHPI community. Specifically, we did a recent report in 2021 on health amongst Asian, the AAPI group, a Asian Pacific Islanders in New York City, as well as a brief on disparities among Asian New Yorkers. There's more we can do, but just know that we're paying attention. But I wanna also talk about how these reports Reports are great, but how do they lead to action? So during one of these recent surveys, we learned that while overall smoking prevalence in New York was similar across race and ethnicity groups, when we considered race and began to, um, when we considered race, ethnicity, gender, and nativity together, we started to reveal deep inequities. For example, in 2019 to 2020, API men born outside of the US were more likely to smoke than US born API men by fourfold. That led us to establish a Chinese language nicotine cessation campaign, which helps support our state partners, Asian smokers, Quitline, and offering free telephone counseling, self help materials, free nicotine patches, and online help in Cantonese, Mandarin, Korean, and Vietnamese. Because these were, because we lifted up those very specific languages. In our survey, we actually were able to tailor an approach in these languages. It wasn't all AA and HPI groups that were experiencing this smoking disparities. It was these groups. And that was one of our most successful campaigns of 2022 and 2023 because we were able to just target it very, very well. And again, as I said, government is a blunt instrument at times, but when we have the data, we can respond. When we have the data, we can react and actually do things in a much more let's say bespoke or tailored way to what community members are telling us. Uh, more broadly, we know of course that language access is critical to reaching as many New Yorkers as possible. Um, we provide language services and we believe it's vital um, to the agency's mission of protecting and improving the health of all New Yorkers, as well as addressing health disparities, racial justice and social justice. So, and we're trying to walk the talk um, the health department translates all essential agency documents into the top 13 city languages, which includes simplified traditional Chinese, Korean, Urdu, and Bengali. 
but also has consistently offered, and COVID really accelerated this process for us, um, interpretation services in over 200 plus languages. Again, it's not perfect. We can get better. We can always improve, but know that there is a real commitment here. And that's helped us that this disaggregated data and this approach to language access has actually helped us engage in a more targeted approach around translating health messaging. For example, South Asian children um, and adults in New York City are more likely to have elevated blood lead levels than the citywide population. That's not just due to things like housing stock, it's also due to exposure to um, food, su substances in food, or even in makeup and cosmetics that originate in um, countries of origin in South Asia. And so as a result of these data disaggregated by specific group, we focused on translating all of our lead poisoning prevention materials into Hindi, Bengali, Nepalese, Punjabi, and Urdu. Um, again, we'll see what the response is, but we've already heard feedback that awareness has increased. So this is important. This is starting to pay off. This summer, um, I attended a blood pressure screening event in the community at White and Washington Houses in a NYCHA development in Upper Manhattan. And this is a community that has undergone massive transition, right? A historically Black and Latino community that now is uh, has a massive Mandarin and Cantonese speaking community. But you wouldn't ordinarily think it, right? Unless you understand the way that demographics have shifted in this city. And so when we went out to do the blood pressure engagement, we of course brought Mandarin speaking, Cantonese speaking um, translators to do blood pressure counseling. And it was great to see that our teams were using data to tailor the approach at a very personal, personalized le uh, level. Look, at the end of the day, it's not New Yorker's job to trust us. It's our job to be trustworthy. And every single day I stand up in this job is an effort at building trust. Um, there's a saying that trust goes um, up by the staircase and down by the elevator. And it's kind of true, right? When you lose trust, it becomes even harder and harder and harder to build back up. But I know this, that the trust that we may have either gained or lost during COVID um, and during other emergencies is can't be, uh, our approach to building trust can't just be centered around these crises. It has to be based on day after day, block after block, engagement, conversation, and events like this. And so I'm extremely glad to be here to, um, to lift this up. We know that there is, has been historical lack of access. And as a result of that lack of access, a historical mistrust and distrust that can develop with communities that are overlooked. This can include things like denial of care, substandard care. Um, we have to do more, and you have my commitment to do more as a proud member of this community. Lastly, uh, we can't do it alone. Um, as I said, um, I'm really excited about these data, not only for because they are now in the world, but because they weren't collected by us, right? I actually think it's great that it wasn't collected by us. No, not because of the, all the reasons you would think around resourcing and time and staff, but because it reflects community partnership, right? Because when we look through these data and we can validate these data, then they become our data, the collective data, not just from government, but our community data. And we bring to bear, and we can even look at areas in which this data makes things more granular for us and helps us further tailor and design our programs. So we're very grateful to all of the partners in this room for for doing this project and for partnering with us to lift it up. Um, so, like I said, it's, it's so nice to be here today. I wanna thank CACF, I wanna thank Change Insight, I wanna thank CSL as well, and it's my pleasure to introduce Bonnie Fong, uh, board chair of CASL, who's going to lead, who leads the New York Area Change Insight Partners uh, panel. Did you, wanna, did you wanna take a couple of questions? Maybe? Oh, I'm happy to take yeah, questions, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as it's not about budgets. <laughs> 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 not answer it. <laughs> no question. Happy to talk to folks afterwards, but thank you for having me. Uh, have a great day. Oh. Where am I looking? Oh, 
uh, where do things stand on data disaggregation? What are the current priorities at Goldman? Um, you know, we've spent a lot of effort on race-based um, disaggregation, and now ethnicity and language are the next frontier. Um, I would say that we have a rubric of what we want to do, ensuring that it's consistently applied across all of the data that we collect, but also all of the data that other city agencies collect, let alone other data that all of the data that um, clinical partners and other community partners collect. That's the challenge because the health department only collects a certain subset of data that we use from planning. Actually, our most powerful data, and we just launched a new center for population health data science, which is built on this notion that survey data and surveillance data that we collect by our public health authority is only a piece of the puzzle of actually doing planning, whether it's for an emergency or a non-emergency. So it stands to reason that if your clinical partners aren't collecting race data and language data and ethnicity data, it's very hard to bring that data into your aggregated matched um, collated data system. So the long answer, that's a long answer, but it, we're working on it. We do have a frame. We've made real strides on race. I would say it's taken us a good eight years. Uh, COVID sort of accelerated a little bit of it because we saw profound disparities in COVID outcomes and COVID risk. Um, and access, um, but I think the COVID model should help push us forward on rate, on ethnicity, language, um, and as I said, uh, country of origin. Uh, with with mental health, is the Department of uh, DOH uh, MH uh, involved with Thrive, and uh, how involved is, have you guys been with uh, providing services to Asian Americans? Uh, so I want to just say this as clearly as I can. Thrive is not really a framework we use anymore. It, it was a, it was a set of initiatives from a previous administration that is, we launched a mental health plan, a very comprehensive mental health plan that takes on three principal drivers, overdose, serious mental illness, and youth mental health. Um, and across those things, lifting up the needs of minoritized communities, AAMHPIs. Um, we launched specifically on this question. So, so Thrive really isn't a model that we consider anymore. Um, on the issue of AAPI mental health, we launched a AAPI suicide prevention initiative, um, which was built around this notion of community conversations around mental health and, and suicide risk. Um, I'm the family member of uh, someone who committed suicide when I was 10 years old in my family. And I just saw how we buried that for decades. I mean, it wasn't even until I was in my 30s that my parents told me that it was a suicide. So this is, it. we have a lot of work to do in this space. Um, and it's only, I don't think that, that government is gonna be in the best position to lead on that. What we need to do is find the resources and partner with groups like CACF groups like Charles B. Wong, CASL, and so forth. Okay, oh, great. Uh, sure. I, I know you said not to mention budget, but when you said API <laughs> suicide <laughs> prevention initiative, is that something that's uh, like on a website? Like how, is it just like starting out or? Well, we budgeted for it last year. Okay. It got funded and then Life happens. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's still underway. Uh, you know, we haven't really in earnest gotten out the door, but we still have the resources reserved for it. So, so it's like in the works and in the works, you may yeah. reach out to CBOs or Oh something. certainly, yeah. We can't do it without CBOs. The whole model is based on CBOs leading conversations in partnership with the health department. But the health department's footprint is relatively small in this. What we want to do is resource, collect data. And, and identify the spaces where this conversation can have the biggest impact. We have a lot of work to do in our community on mental health, on normalizing a discussion around mental health. And it's not the same for every kid. Talk about diversity and tapestry of our community. It's the idea that the Chinese community and the, the South Indian community are gonna talk about mental health in similar ways is actually not, I have not found that to be true. <laughs> so <laughs> please correct me. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, and I'm eager to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So we historically have collected surveillance data in this city built on our public health authority, which means there are sets of conditions that health facilities, laboratories are mandated to report to us. But as you can imagine, that's only a subset of the universe, right? It's only mostly infectious diseases. It leaves out mental health, it leaves out chronic diseases, overdoses. And what we then are left with is a, a deeply siloed data universe. Second is that the surveys, the cross-sectional surveys that we used to do, the community health survey was transformative 20 years ago. But 20 years on, no one is using our community health survey data for planning or resourcing, in part because we are awash in data. We are awash in data from healthcare systems, from payers, community organizations, CBOs, even consumer wearables. I mean, there's, and the private sector is, we, we are awash in health data and we are short on insight. And so we, are, we built the Center for Population Health Data Science to, to try to solve for one specific thing. How do we create a data hub where we can break down some of the uh, governance barriers, data matching barriers, where we can bring tools like AI and machine learning to bear, to bring big data sets together and clean them um, and to just move faster to gain insight using our public health authority, but not based all on mandated reporting. So our vision is that we actually have dashboards for things like overdoses, for things like mental health conditions, for things like diabetes um, and heart disease and so on and so forth. So we have work to do, um, but COVID, COVID actually um, set a new bar for transparency of data in terms of the routine the routine uh, way in which we publish data to the put data out in the public. And I'd like to see that that model in a non-crisis environment, uh, which is why we created the center and we hired leaders from healthcare and from the private sector to help us build it because government doesn't have a good track record. On this. <clears throat> Done? Okay, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bassan, for your leadership. It is so inspiring to see officials like yourself recognize the importance of what Change Insight is doing for AA and HPI and underrepresented communities. So thank you. Um, I'm Bonnie Fong, Castle's board chair, and I am so proud um, that our organization is part of this exciting and important initiative. Um, so what value does Change Insight bring our partners? How is the data changing the way they work with their communities or how they reflect on and assess their own organization's impact? Uh, to discuss the findings more in depth, I'd love to invite a few of our community partners to join me for a panel discussion. Wayne Ho, President and CEO of the American Planning Council, come on up. Uh, Suda Akaya, Executive Director of the South Asian Council for Social Services, and Cliff Tenkoza, Director of Public Policy for the National Federation of Filipino American Associations. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, first, I'd like to welcome you to introduce yourselves and tell us about your organization and the communities that you serve. Pay attention at all. <laughs> 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 Can, you, <laughs> Can you repeat the yeah. question? Oh, so just These are really high stool. It took us a while to get I know. Out. I know. I'm not really sure. So, so um, <laughs> exactly. Give me the boost. Oh, uh, just, just please. Well, I welcome you to introduce yourself. Tell, tell us a little about yourself, your organization, and the communities you serve. I think Wayne should start off here. He has a lot of lot to say. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Wayne. Nice cover. Uh, so good morning, good to see everyone. Thank you for inviting myself and Chinese American Planning Council to join. So I'm the president and CEO of CPC. We were founded in 1965 with a mission to promote the social and economic empowerment of Chinese American immigrant and low income communities. Uh, to our knowledge, we've now grown to become the largest Asian American Pacific Islander social services nonprofit in the country. So we serve about 80,000 New Yorkers and employ about 5,200 New Yorkers. Um, of the 80,000 we serve, two thirds are Asian American, mostly Chinese. The other third represents the diversity of New York, so black, brown, and other uh, immigrant and low-income New Yorkers. 
And our work falls under three pillars, uh, education, family support, and uh, community and economic empowerment. So we serve everyone from two to 102 at CPC, uh, 35 locations in Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. Um, my name is Sudha Acharya. I am the executive director of South Asian Council for Social Services, which we call a SACS. SACS was founded in the year 2000. They're not as old as the CPC, right? or not as big. Right? And so we'll be uh, celebrating the 25th anniversary uh, next year. Right? So it was, uh, we, you know, of course, everybody talks about the modern minority especially about South Asians, everybody thought that they were all doctors and engineers and scientists and digital prodigies, uh, prodigies, right? But we knew that that was not true. The organization was started to serve the basic needs of uh, underserved South Asians and other immigrant communities. Uh, it, it so happens that we are in Flushing, uh, Queens, and that is one of the most diverse counties, you know, the Queens itself is very diverse. I, I know I'm holding it to the case. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Queens itself is very diverse. So it so happens that we, uh, we served, last year we served 200,000 people, right, in the Queens, as well as there are people who come from other town, other boroughs as well, uh, but mostly Queens. But our uh, clientele, uh, it, it is, yeah, it is true, it has a large number of South Asians, but being in Flushing, it has a large number of Chinese and other immigrant communities as well. So, uh, what we realized is that uh, it was, uh, I, I think Dr. Watson talked about, and everybody is talking about the, it's how important it is to speak the languages of the community to gain their trust. And of course, cultural sensitivity is very important too. So our staff, which, which is well, it is not 5200, <laughs> it is 21 full time and one part time, right? Uh, our, our staff is as diverse as Queens itself. Right? So as we have a large number of uh, Chinese uh, clients, we have hired a full time uh, Mandarin and Cantonese speaking uh, 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 staff member, manager. And as we have Hispanic clients as well, so we hired a Mexican American, uh, you know, uh, manager who uh, who actually serves them. But of course, the others we speak twelve South Asian languages and seven others, like so, nineteen languages. And uh, we're very we're very glad that uh, this this survey uh, has been done, and it it helps us a great deal. And we'll speak further about. Impact. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Clifford Robin Samprosa. Um, we are the National Federation of Filipino American Associations, which is NAFA. Uh, it is the largest umbrella federation for Filipino uh, American organizations across the nation. We are in New York, for so we are the New York chapter. Uh, for those of you who may or may not know, we are started by an amazing uh, woman, Nicola Lourdes Lewis, who is a historic civil rights uh, attorney and the first. Asian uh, American Asian woman to pass the bar, right? Um, so we were founded under the tenet of promoting civic engagement, civil rights, and policy and advocacy for not just Filipino Americans but Filipino migrant workers, OFWs, Filipino immigrants, and the families that have been moved intergenerationally when they first arrived in California to those who are settling with new roots in areas like New York. Um, we do a lot of work surrounding policy because we understand that the Filipino voices have been excluded and marginalized when we are quoted as America's little brother. Right, and that is a history of colonialism in the Philippines that we advocate in New York and across the nation to fight against, to promote the identity of Filipinos and Filipino Americans. Well, one thing, yeah, Cliff, why don't we kick off the panel with you. Um, tell us, how can Change Insight impact your organization and community? Yeah, so when we first saw the survey, automatically we jumped, we gotta do it. Reason being is because not only A and HPI voices have been ex have been typically not included in data and, and measuring uh, quantity or quantitative data, specifically for Filipinos and Filipino Americans because of that history of colonialism, we typically have a different set of stressors 
that uh, promote a different level of marginalization, right? Our stressors come from a point of privilege where typically Western culture, because of that colonial history, has um, tokenized Filipinos in a very, very different light, where when you look at the data, you'll see that most Filipinos who undertook the survey had labeled themselves as being housed, having a degree, um, being of middle class or upper middle class uh, backgrounds economically, but what that does is create a lot of division between us and other Asian communities within the diaspora, right? Uh, another, sh another point that is really important is we, a lot of us speak English, even back home. A lot of our communities, people in, um, who are probably born between the years of 2000 and up, a lot of them don't speak our dialects anymore. Why? Because of media, because of history, because of context, English is a promoted first language in our country. And therefore, rather than taking a look at what the data can tell about um, needing language accessibility, we need to find data that reflect it, that makes us need to remember why our language should not be erased, right, as a result of these different stressors. Um, so it reaffirmed our identity, and it reaffirmed what we needed to do to work in solidarity with other community members and partners, taking away from the privileges that we have and undergoing the fight collectively that we need to take to advance as an AHPI diaspora identity. Same question. Same question. Yeah. We were very glad to be a part of this survey and uh, uh, we're extremely glad to, you know, glad to get the results of the data. Uh, we knew, you know, like uh, right from the beginning, the reason the organization was started was because but the needs in the community. Uh, we knew about the poverty. We knew about not knowing English. We knew about not having skills. We knew about food insecurity. All those things we knew. We were acutely aware of that. But what is very good is when we saw the data, we said we, we felt, oh, okay, we felt as though we'd gotten an A plus uh, on the term paper. <laughs> Okay, this this confirms and it's an affirmation of our work. But after that, um, there is there is you know we, we are concerned about how how uh, some of it is even worse than we thought. Okay, like, uh, some of it. And one thing that is sort of different is where we are. It is a very diverse community. Um, we, I see that it's done, it's been done by a race, it's been done by for South Asians and for Chinese and so on. But what, uh, uh, when you see the area, the neighborhood, that also I saw on, on, in, in, in the data there, it's very quite tough to see that it is the unemployment rate for all those people that we serve, right? is double that of other neighborhoods. And, uh, and uh, uh, English, you know, not, not having English as primary language is 20% more than other, other neighborhoods. So that is a cause for concern. I know that we, we do serve people, for instance, they, they talked about, uh, everybody's talking about how important it is to know the languages. I'll tell you about one, one of our clients, a senior, he had been hit by a car and he had a serious concussion. And he's, he was, he did not at that time, but he was suicidal. And after he was passing by our, our organization. And in fact, we have in the languages, in, this, in their script, all the languages that we speak. And he spoke Bengali and he saw that we spoke that and he came inside. Now it's been quite a few years that he's been our client. He, we have connected him to healthcare, we have counseled him, and we have connected him to SNAP. He's a part of our a very active member of our senior center. So th this, can, this can be done. Like, you know, it's not just one thing that you serve. Once they come in because you know you speak their languages and you, you can, they trust you then. And then of course you can have them with many different, uh, different services. Um, so CDC, we definitely wanted more data and wanted to jump in and participate in Change Insight. Um, I can't honestly say that my entire team said yes, we're all in on it. And the context for that is 
we are 75% government funded. So the way our systems have been set up is that the funding, the city funding agency that funds my six early childhood centers want a certain amount of data and a certain amount of input. And obviously they don't give us enough funding to have staff to input data. My senior centers, the four of them get funding and the department for the aging wants a certain amount of data. And again, we don't have staff to input that data. And I can give you that example from the participants in our adult literacy programs to the youth in our summer youth employment program. <clears throat> what I think to Suda's point is that on the ground, what we see then is we get calls from our allies in Long Island City, Queens, saying there's more Chinese moving into this NYCHA building. Can you help us out? We get calls from during the pandemic, especially from a group that was trying to start up in East Harlem saying, there's a lot of Chinese here from Chinese professionals to Chinese who just want to have easy access along the six train to Chinatown. And we need to support them when we hear they're in overcrowded housing to just a couple months ago, an ally who runs a Latin American organization said, I'm starting to see more and more Chinese come to Staten Island uh, to come to our food pantry. Can you help out? And these stories are what we see also with our community members whom we serve. Seniors will come in and sometimes due to stigmas, they'll share what's going on or sometimes they don't. Uh, but we hear they might be in overcrowded housing. We also hear from some of our program participants that they don't, like we think we're really at language accessible, but they speak a dialect that's not Chinese, oh, sorry, that's not Mandarin or Cantonese or Fujianese. And do we have the proper staffing to accommodate other Chinese dialects? So this is all to say that we have a lot of, we had to balance out anecdotal data with government mandated data collection, but we know that our community members vote with their feet. So every day we get 1200 seniors that come to our four older adult centers. During the summer, we have over 3000 young people who come for summer youth employment programs. We have over 300 kids come to our early childhood centers and they're coming because we, they know we're trusted, we support them, we're culturally competent, we're language accessible, we're immigrant accessible, regardless of your immigration status. And that's why Change Insight helps, is because we can be more data informed in how we do our work. You know, there's that saying, what gets uh, measured gets noticed, and it gets noticed for how we do our work now, because we know we're rolling out curriculum that, let's be honest, the curriculum that we are taught is not, or we use oftentimes, is not made for our communities. So we have to adapt it to make sure that a mostly immigrant, mostly language, um, limited English proficient community members can access services. So the data helps us refine our curriculum, the data helps us look at how we can expand and deepen our services. And more importantly, because we know that AAPIs were 18% of New York City, we get less than 1% of social service contract dollars from the city, we get less than a quarter of 1% in philanthropic dollars from private foundations. The data then is helps us make the case that our communities, our services, our staff should no longer be under-resourced or um, underrepresented. Thank you. So um, Suda, you mentioned the data being worse than you thought. You mentioned high unemployment amongst your community. Wayne, you referenced anecdotal data. Question for the panel, did Change in Sight uncover any surprising information about the communities that you serve? And um, did it quantify for you um, any kind of find, anything that you thought existed but didn't have data on? So I, I put that to all three of you. Uh, one of the things that I told you about was uh, uh, how uh, the da data for the neighborhood differs from the data for the initial communities. Okay, so supposing we have a certain uh, data for uh, South Asians or Asian Indians, right, and you have certain data for the Chinese, right, but we have a mix of all those, right. So this neighborhood data. So we have to look at that, right? That is the that is reality for us, right? Uh, it, it, of course, it is it helps to know the racial part of it, but um, okay, what is true of our neighborhood? So that's what we need to do. 
the other thing was you had uh, you had risk factors there, right? Like uh, so, those risk factors, the complexity, right? Um, if it is uh, above six points, that it is um, it, it 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 means that uh, the uh, health outcomes that it makes for low health come, you know, poor health outcomes, right? Our neighborhood has eight point two. So you can imagine, like uh, all the mix of all these things together, that's what makes it like rather complex. Rather, rather it, it, the risk is there, you know. Big. So that was surprising. Yeah. So of course, all together, yeah, we really surveyed them for on their basic needs of various things, but it all put together, obviously, makes for poor health. Yeah, and I think for uh, or I know for us is that. Uh, our mission it has always been looking at empowerment and justice in terms of social and economic justice. Um, and we've always been respectful of our allies in the community that provide health services. So Charles B. Lane Community Health Services, Appalachian Community Health Center, we've always do a lot of cross referrals. Um, so having data that specifically looked at social determinants of health and looking at health outcomes of our community members and how risk factors weigh in and um, the intersectionality of those became really uh, enlightening for us on the data. Um, additionally, we were interested in seeing how other localities did the work. And I think it's great because a lot of us talk all the time and we always compare information about what's going well with you, how you're dealing with this issue at your school programs, what's going on with your seniors. Like we talk a lot in New York, but having data to compare across CBOs in New York and then looking at how Castle does their work or folks in community organizations and other um, localities do their work became very enlightening to us to truly understand not just service delivery and how we can do it better for different populations, but once again, what does it mean for us when we advocate for more resources at the state and city level for our community members? And what does it mean when we have longer conversations with philanthropy and foundations and corporations to make sure there's more equitable resources for our communities? Right. Let me cut it. it. It's not that the uh, data on races is, is not important. It's extremely important. We know that. But uh, we are interested in the labor differences. Yeah, just want to just want to echo that. Like, I think we live in a New York where your zip code determines whether or not you're healthy. Right. We we all know that. But also, when you combine that zip code to the access to jobs in those areas, the access of housing. I think it's unfair, it's unjust that New Yorkers, especially New Yorkers of A and HPI descent, have to choose between a good quality of life and poverty. They should not have to choose between um, a house or healthcare, a house or a job, a job or sending or sending their kids to a good education, uh, a job or taking care of their parents, right? All of these determinants are, you know, it's simple language. There's been not there hasn't been enough work being been done by government or by a lot of folks to allocate resources, right? I think um, you know, I was I, I've been thinking this about this a lot lately. Outcome, you know, uh, it's like an outcome is the only outcome. It's about the approach, how you get from A to B. You know, we can say everyone is guaranteed healthcare. We can say people are guaranteed um, resources, but why are you giving them resources? Is it because you want to check your box off? Or is it because you actually believe that the data and the history says that we have not been given what we deserve, right? And it's only going to get worse as we start settling and generations start growing in New York. We take a look at California. Right, we take a look at, um, or let's say the West Coast, let's take a look at the East Coast, right? Uh, we should learn how the West Coast has organized to build dollars and to build resources and where they've gone wrong, right? And we need to learn how we can bring that up in New York, because let's be honest here, um, this data really determines what it's like to be of a singular Asian ethnicity, um, from what I've seen. I'm Filipino and Chinese. It's very common in the Philippines, but in the East Coast, it's not common to be multi-ethnic Asian, right? So those outcomes will look a lot different as we grow in the next 10, 20, 30 years, but we need to set a foundation, very clear foundation of money, of capital, of civic empowerment, of civil rights. But most importantly, we need to have a first off mentality that this is what we must do and prove to people why we need to do it. That's exactly what the data reaffirms here. Um, just one last question. Um, how do you plan to use the data? If you can give me a couple of thoughts. Uh, sure. Uh, we've already started using uh, some of the preliminary data. But one is 
we do want to be a more data driven organization and spread it across our programs as well as our policy and advocacy work. So we want that to inform our work, really identify needs, identify risks, and develop programs and deepen programs better. Secondly, is to look at how this really informs our policy and advocacy work. And I know in the last three years when the pandemic started, we're fortunate to partner with a lot of folks here, led by CACF to get funding from the city council specifically for their API organizations, and then also at the state level for API organizations and the council members, state legislators were obviously champions with us. Uh, but we know we need to have more advocacy and the data should drive it. So whether that's funding to make sure we can address community needs or continue our work, because we all hire from the community. And I think it's important for us to remember that we as nonprofit and community-based organizations are also employers and um, can drive the economy in our local neighborhoods. So that's why we continue to fight for just pay for human services workers, fair pay for home care workers, because we want our own workers to thrive themselves as they continue to give back to their communities. Um, the state has been very, very useful. It's very timely. Uh, we, are all, we, are, uh, we are all going to be applying for discretionary funding to the city council. Uh, the proposal has come up and we are all preparing, right? It's, it's right. It's, just in the right the time that it's been released, and we will definitely use it for that. As we said, of course, this will be great for advocacy, right? So we'll be doing that based on, we, we were, we were talking about based on our experiences and what our knowledge of the, uh, at, at the grassroots level, but now we'll be advocating with data, which, which will be great. Yeah, I think for NAFA, the vision is to burst bubbles, right? Burst bubbles outside of our community, but first off within our community. Um, and what, what that looks like is bursting the bubble of Filipinos who came here through the nursing shortage in the, in between the 60s and 90s who have built some sort of intergenerational wealth for, for their families and say, hey, you might live like this, but look at how everyone else in our diaspora lives. Right. Again, the fact that our communities grow up speaking English in the Philippines already gives them an advantage economically in the United States once they get once they get here. We need to burst that bubble and say that's us. But what about everyone else here? Right. It's about the collective, um, not just the individual of how my family, my community can can thrive. It's about um, just because I live in a or someone lives in a certain level of privilege or affluence, that does not mean everyone else in the other half does. So that's a B. Um, I think it's going to be used to motivate Filipinos to get more involved, right? Um, I'll be very honest, a lot of people who took our survey were between the ages of 18 to 40, right? Hence, there's a lot of a lot more mental health outcomes that came up with the data. But our goal is to use this data as a starting point to get Filipinos more engaged in what advocacy looks like and getting involved in the community. Listen, we're, we're, we've been here for a while, but we have not been activated until the past 10, 15 years. We just elected our first Filipino assembly member the legislature. That's a first step, but that's not the last step, right? We can all we all have felt that feeling here when it's like the first to elect our first. But most of the time, it's not about the first; it's about how we keep going from there, right? And then the third piece that we want to burst the bubble for is really just talk about how um, what gathering this data looks like, right? Gathering the data, but then also implementing it in a way that we can use on the ground to just tell other communities more about the Filipino community, not just for good singers, which. I have a mic right now, I could really try it. <laughs> um, not just we are good cooks, not just you know this, right? I think it really shows the day-to-day -day reality that, again, within our community and every other community, um, when we try to fight for racial justice, like this is exactly what it is. I remember one time, and this is where I'll stop, um, when I first got involved in advocacy, I was walking around, um, I think, flushing with some community members. They, we were a diverse group. Honestly, we were getting um, Korean barbecue. Um, and these were folks who were paralegals and business, uh, people who worked in business, and they said, um, yeah, Clifford, I know you started off working in Bronx government and politics. Uh, how do you feel safe or how do you feel secure or how does it feel like when you have to walk through the Bronx? Mind you, where I lived in the Bronx, it was typically black and brown Latino communities. And I said, hey, if you talk to them and you say, what are the, fir the first three issues that you care about? They say, I want, to, I want better living conditions, I want good health care, I want my kids to do better than me and want them to have a good education. Now, take away everything else, you know, it, it, they, they were shocked. They were shocked. They literally were like, really? And I said, yeah. 
because at the end of the day, we are people, we are New Yorkers, we are humans who have been pitted against a system that has kept us down, but also told us that we need to be competing against each other, right? And that's exactly why the work that uh, Hassel.cacf does, this, this survey is important, because now it, it mends everything together to say, hey, it's not about, uh, yes, the ethnicity matters, but we have to take a look at the overall structure of what has kept us down as people, as people of color, right? So that's what, we're gonna birth bubbles. Thank you, thank you. Thank you each for being a part of Change Insight and providing your insights today. It's one thing to talk about data at a high level, but it's an entirely different thing to hear about how organizations like yours are actually making an impact using data. data. So thank you. I also wanna thank you all for CACF and Castle. You're gonna bring us out to Hawaii to find Hawaii partners and do this panel all over again, especially during the winter in New York. And you guys are awesome. So thanks to that. Let's change insight and Hawaii. Thanks, thanks. Okay. So now we can all see why change insight is important. However, a project like this simply cannot happen without philanthropists and grant writers who choose to support this vision. One of the first people to see the potential in Change Insight and provide us with the support we needed to launch was Jessica Zerowitz, a visionary filmmaker and philanthropist who made this possible through the Julian Grace Foundation. So thank you. Uh, Jessica, would you like to come up and share a few thoughts on what you saw in Change Insight from the very beginning? Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Good morning, everyone. Um, once again, I uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation of being here today from uh, Castle Chinese American Service League in Chicago. And it is really, truly an honor to uh, address uh, this esteemed uh, group here today in New York. New York is one of my favorite cities. Um, yes, I live in Chicago. I also live in Los Angeles. And I have actually funded uh, through uh, various initiatives of the Julie Grace Foundation, I am the board chair, um, and privately uh, as a family, the Sarowitz family, um, even uh, funded some CBOs in New York as well. So we are, at, you know, we do the work nationally. Um, I am an impact investor, I'm a philanthropist, a movie maker, and also a bit of a data geek. Uh, I, one of my uh, careers a uh, long, long time ago was as a data analyst, as a project manager, as a software, uh, you know, in charge of software development for a big, big data company, uh, a collector. So I know a little bit about uh, what the challenges are with working with big data, with uh, real-time data, and uh, all of the challenges when you have to integrate across many different platforms, many different softwares, and um, also how to uh, tell the story of data so that it can be used in a targeted uh, you know, insights or interventions um, to either you know, give people aha moments that are trying to give service levels or client um, service satisfaction or, uh, you know, a holistic approach to how to do the work. A lot of times it's about gap analysis and uh, really, truly uh, utilizing, also utilizing this um, sort of understanding that you need trust, you know. CBOs uh, are uniquely, uniquely positioned in communities to give that sort of, uh, be the deliverer, not only of services, but of the, the information that is needed in communities to validate that you are not on the scene, that you are um, you know, not embraced from the uh, conversation that needs to vitally be uh, you know, in the, uh, the, the rooms of government, in the rooms of private enterprise, um, and also in uh, you know philanthropic circles uh, with funders and supporters of of this uh, you know the kind of work that we want to see when it comes to social justice, 
um, and um, you know the sort of representation uh, of minoritized uh, or marginalized in some cases in the resource communities. So with Change Insight, when um, about 15 years ago, I want to say that I had the great privilege of being in a room of Asian American um, leaders, emerging leaders, and um, the topic, one of the conversations of the day was, gee, you know, I wish that we as, um, you know, nonprofit uh, communities could uh, band together and share data more easily, but be the owners of our own data, right? Um, and, but then we started talking about all of the problems with this. Um, we don't have the money, we can't overcome all of the different sort of uh, processes or system structures that are in, in all of these uh, nonprofit, um, you know, uh, organizations. And so it was kind of a depressing sort of, you know, a sort of conversation. And, you know, like 15 years later, that, that conversation uh, came to mind for me. And uh, Paul uh, and various members of the staff uh, came to me with this idea, this vision of uh, starting a, a data-centric project. Um, and I said, oh my God, yes, this, this is uh, potentially uh, very vital to the community. And I said, of course, let's do this. Let's think about, you know, from a, well, I, I do a lot of entrepreneurial work as well. And um, so Sarah Ritz family uh, has, uh, you know, made their money. We, we are on the Forbes uh, list uh, through our work in payroll and human resources. So we're, we're no stranger to big data as well. And then also the uh, commitment that we have to better the lives of people. Um, through our human resources and our payroll information. So, um, you know, uh, I had a discussion around uh, the strategy. Uh, you know, could this thing go private? Could this thing, should it remain as a nonprofit, nonprofit venture? And ultimately, you know, I, we talked about the pros and cons of everything, and uh, I'm so happy that uh, Castle and Paul and his staff have taken on this deep challenge. Um, and it is a nonprofit-led initiative to bring the uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community, uh, you know, more in a more collaborative, cohesive manner to bring them together um, and help to co-create this, uh, you know, this vision, this, this solution um in, in this work so because it's not like it's static you know it's like not like it's static it has to evolve with uh, input from the cbo's from the network partners from even you know the government institutions and from the private enterprises as well um because everyone has a, a good ideas and everyone ultimately wants to see i think uh communities um have better income uh, better uh, outcomes and so, um, you know, philanthropists like me are interested in this work, we're interested in, in, in the data work, and, um, you know, we want to see it uh, happen and, and leverage the power within the communities and the CBOs to do this work and have the ownership of this. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm here today, and I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to uh, address everyone here, and if you have any questions um, afterwards, I'm more than happy to address any questions in private and um, around, you know, what does a philanthropist uh, think about this, or how does how to involve other uh, foundations, private philanthropy, uh, you know, individuals of private philanthropy in more uh, direct giving and so on and so forth. I also want to um, thank today uh, the Julie, our executive director, Scott McCowan from the Julie Grace Foundation for being here today. He also is available afterwards to, uh, you know, speak to people and, 
uh, address any questions you may have. Uh, the Julian Grace Foundation does high engagement grant making, uh, practice trust-based philanthropy. We also give grants for capacity building, um, which you know is something that we're very proud that we do that um, because we want to have um, not only you know uh, provide for funding for targeted sort of the day to day needs of people, but also to um, help CBOs um, have better sort of um, you know to help them with their long term strategy uh, initiatives and projects. And this was why the, that we were truly on board and remain on board with helping in this change inside initiative. So um, I think that's really all that I would like to say today because, you know, I like to keep my remarks short and sweet. Um, but uh, thank you once again. And I know that Paul is coming up here to, uh, you know, close this out for us. Well, um, I just want to take a moment to to thank Jessica, uh, you know, Jessica, for your continued support of not just Chains in Sight uh, for the AN, AANHPI communities and all our partnering organization. Um, but, ladies and gentlemen, um, Jessica, the Sorwitz Family Foundation, has uh, captured my heart. Um, our relationship, and the more I continue to learn and to acknowledge Jessica's leadership, they not only serve an impact organization in this country, but the world. So uh, you have an amazing leader in this room that you now can have some conversation who is innovative, creative, and who just really want to be a change agent for this world. So thank you, uh, Jessica, again, for your leadership. Uh, thank you so much. Um, wow, um, I just also want to share a partner's survey over six or nearly 6,000 individuals across the country representing 30 uh, different ANHPI uh, population. And so I want to assure all of you there is so much for us to learn from this report and in the future. Uh, the full report, again titled Community Counts, is available at uh, www.changeinsight.org and uh, is in English, simplified Chinese, Hindi, Urdu, Korean, and Bengali. And we also have a, a limited number of printed copies here today. So I encourage all of you, you can grab that report, uh, not just to read it, but to share it among yourselves, your staff, your board of directors, your leaders in your community so that you put your community voice at the table. That's critical. Um, thank you for changing like partner organizations, the partners uh, who spoke today our partners uh, who are our elected leaders in the city and across the country, our funders, and also our supporters who are at times invisible, but they do the great work with us all the time. And especially the individuals, the families who share their experience for the survey. They're critical for the success. So with that, um, I'm gonna say thank you. I'm gonna take some questions. Please be kind to me. Um, I know there's a lot of questions already, but I do want to say that uh, where is Wayne? We're not going to Hawaii, unfortunately. Okay. That's why he uh, and For some reason, he always sticks me in the bill. Um, and also, would love to hear Cliff would sing sometime. Oh, we got to pay me for that. Yeah. So, any questions uh, some of you may have, I can help to answer. And also, our partners can answer too. Any questions? No? Okay, just want to add one comment. I would have been approached by a lot uh, is that will we eventually survey young people? And that's across the country. 
I get texts and emails from LA to Seattle, Houston, all over. The changes that can do this from 18 and older, why not 18 and under? And so we are looking to that. Some of these questions that we're asking, we need to make sure that legal guardians, the parents have given us consent. There's some issues with data, right? But we know that between the ages of 16 to 24, API and HPI community youth have the highest suicide rate in the country. Right, so today we talk about mental health. So maybe that's something that Castle, Change Insight, the partners, the leaders that we can talk about that we can pivot in the future so that we can capture this data so that all of us, our community, and as Dr. Rasan said, he lost a family member to suicide mental health. We want to make sure that our young people are represented at these reports too. So, yeah. Any other questions, Vanessa? Oh. Um, Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for the current members, and please sign your MOUs. Yeah. We can't start. Uh, second, uh, Alex Montgomery, she's here, over here. She's the director of Center for Social Impact. Uh, we also can host uh, virtual uh, community meetings. And also, we want to ask you to make sure you share the report and your experience with your community partners, the ones who are saying, I need data, I need funding, I need support. Well, this is a good mechanism for us to take the next step. So we are now trying to increase to 35 organizations across the country. So please don't have to be New York. So if there's other community organization around the country, you may know who needs this. Share this with them. Then we're going to uh, do some training Right, so we have uh, trainers that will fly around the country, will come to your organizations without cost and provide empathic inquiry training so that your staff are not providing biased questions to your community. We want to make sure that's really scientific. Right? And then finally, uh, as we uh, you know collecting data with the trainings, we'll have another uh, round uh, of uh, meetings to discuss about the data. Are there similar data points from New York to LA, to Chicago? Can we work together to ask for funding from the foundation? Or better yet, perhaps the federal government's in the tens of millions of dollars so that when we have a small organization, let's say a half a million dollars, working with a CPC, a hundred some plus million dollars. Oh, how much? 250. Okay, Larry, that's a lot of money. Uh, 250 million dollars. We are working together as a collective so that we're supporting everyone. So that we can secure millions together, we're not just supporting one big organization or two, but every organization have collected data points together, be it employment, language issues, uh, uh, healthcare issues, uh, that's one of the goals for this organization, this project. Any questions? Yes. Such as what? Well, that's a great question. Uh, currently, uh, we use Prepare the survey. And so there's been a lot of question of can we dive deeper into the data? And what we want to do is, to, you know, beginning in a few years is get a really good baseline and then start having conversation with organizations that if we want to expand it be behavior, uh, mental health or employment or housing, we can talk to our coalition partners and we can start looking at different surveys. But as of now, not just yet, we just really want to build that baseline around the country. Thank you, though. Any other question? Yeah. Hi. I'm curious. I, I saw that um, the survey uses the AHPI acronym. I'm curious um, on like data collection for data points that you 
Well, this is where we need all of you. We need your support. We have, CASA has reached out to uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander organizations. So many of them, they have shared that they don't have the capacity. Now, the ones who have done this project, you really need just a laptop or a computer, right? An internet, a dedicated staff who's connected with a change insight team member, right? And go through training. If you're already serving people in your community or organization, you can ask, hey, do you have 20, 20 minutes? But we have reached out to uh, PI organizations in Utah and Colorado. Uh, we've been at OCA National Conference where we have spoke to leaders about how we want their voice at the table in this project. But I would ask that you know if you're interested and you want to give that voice for the community, the Native Hawaiian community, reach out to Alex Montgomery or Change Insight and let us know how we can connect so we can work together. Because this, this project is not just about data, it's about relationships. And you all have relationships across the country that can really transform a community and organization. But I would love that. And it's just not Native Hawaiian, but they're working so hard to get the Hmong population and, and the Cambodian community. I was in St. Saint, uh, Saint Anna just in November for a week trying to uh, have a conversation so in California with leaders about the Cambodian communities. That is a changing, moving population right now. The Hmong population, Lowell Hamilton, right? Uh, Lowell, I'm sorry, Lowell, Massachusetts was the second largest uh, Hmong uh, Cambodian community, I'm sorry, Cambodian community outside of Cambodia. So we're, we're having those conversations with so many of them say it's, it's you know, Paul's capacity. Yeah. I just had that question yesterday from the Chicago organization. Uh, we, I don't think we track undocumented or documented, right, Alex? But the partners get that data. I don't believe we ask that question. Part of the calculus for us would also be people's comfort level with telling you the answers to that question and how, what categories we want in terms of immigration status. I know we do ask refugee. It's not in here, but it does exist in the table. But that's a good point for us to bring back to the table and for us to have uh, some conversation with our leadership team because we're seeing more undocumented community, not just the ones from Venezuela, right, and uh, from Central America, um, South America. Uh, I get calls about, are we seeing Chinese community, um, undocumented community members in Chinatown? We are. And, you know, and they're taking a different route where they go from Turkey to fly to Ecuador, and then from Ecuador, they walk all the way to Tijuana, Tijuana, across the border of San Diego, and from there, they disperse all over the country. Uh, but yes, and that would be something really fascinating for us. And when we talk about people, certain people, documented, undocumented, it's just a label, right? People need help. We should be, as a CBO across the country, help people. Yeah. Hi. Um, as far as uh, New York is concerned, we do have a very large number of undocumented. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, they're not the newcomers. There are a lot of them over yes. here. For many, many years. Okay, so the problems become a little different here. Yeah, so and we have the same situation in Chicago also. Right. Scott? Well, quick question for you. Um, as a funder, we're, we're using data to make determinations on where our dollars go and how impactful those dollars can be. And in the book on page 20, it talks about the next steps, and you kind of have three steps. Laid out there, we can evaluate the health and social services that we offer to determine the gaps in developing interventions and how to address the health and social needs. So, kind of my question is as a funder, will there be a report that will be given to us after that aspect is done, which will help us kind of inform like where we direct dollars? So it's one thing to support this, which we want to do, 
but the whole purpose of doing this is to figure out where the gaps and holes are and how do we fill those. And we need that information as to say, okay, this is what is needed, you know, from a priority down. Is there any way, like over the course of the year, another report that you can be doing to this for us as funders? Yes, Scott. Yeah, so it's really the next, uh, we have the data, we're sharing the data, we're working with the CBOs, but it's now it's taking national steps. And so for funders, uh, uh, that report is critical for providing that roadmap of not just funding, but guidance to the, the CBOs, where to go next and how to support the community. Yes. Yeah. And I just want to share that we spoke with the foundation a year and a half ago where we shared the report and we brought the president of the foundation into Castle, and we had a conversation about change in sight and the given multiplied by 10 times. So that helps our organization, but also can help our, our community members and everyone else. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your support and uh, we'll continue with the great work.